when a person comes to Christ, they are instantly born of the Spirit. If that doesn't happen, a person is not saved, okay? So if you're truly saved, you're born of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes to live within you. Without the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit, it would be impossible to live the Christian life. As the praise reports were going on there, I was hearing all the babies, kind of, it was like a choir in this church, and I'm like, you know what? That's a healthy sign in the church. Amen? It's, it's a healthy sign in the natural to have babies. Amen? But it's a healthy sign in the spiritual to have babies. You know, and thank God this place is full of, of babies this morning um, in the natural. And there's a lot of grown up babies here that we've, I'm saying we've matured from babies we're growing. And one of the great ways that God matures us is through the Word of God. Um, you and me know in the natural, um, food in the natural is one of the ways that we grow physically. We develop physically. Well, I can tell you this morning, this book is more important than natural food. And I, I would just encourage you this morning, um, please open up yourself to be fed this morning by him, not by the preacher, but by him this morning. So Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, that we are su- not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen? I've called this message this morning. It is time for an intelligence briefing, part six. It is time for an intelligence briefing, part six. I want to say at the outset that this church is a Christ-centered church. We are spirit-led. We are Bible-believing. Amen? Uh, Christ is the center. He's the focus in this church. But as crucial as it is to know who we are, what we believe, and who is for us, Scripture also instructs us to know who is against us. Amen? Um, Ignorance of your enemy is setting yourself up to be deceived or to be defeated. A lot of the devil's greatest victories come from us swallowing the lie of the devil and result in us being spiritually paralyzed. I want to say this morning, every one of us is susceptible to the lie of the enemy. Amen? Um, On Sunday mornings, we have been looking at the character, the aims, and the ways that we can overcome our arch enemy, the devil. Today is probably the last message looking at how we can effectively counteract the devil and his schemes. How do we do that? I mean, how practically do we counteract the devil? We've been working through nine different points. And I want to just repeat them for the sake of clarity this morning. How do we defeat the devil? We get close to the Lord. We get enlightened. We put on the whole armor of God. We protect our minds. We resist what is being thrown at us. Uh, we remove the junk that's already there, that has made its way through the, our protection. We employ the word of God to injure the devil. We use the name of Jesus and highlight the blood of Jesus Christ. Number nine, where I want to pitch my tent this morning. We let the power of the Holy Spirit enable us to overcome Satan. I want to look at that today. You know, you can divorce, you, you cannot divorce all of these nine things one from another, by the way. They tend to overlap. And it doesn't matter what subject you look at, you can kind of do ten steps to this or uh, four points to this. But a lot of time with spiritual truth, they kind of overlap each other. 
So it's very hard to say where one stops and where the other begins. Um, we've looked at, covered number one to eight over this past few weeks. So I want to look at number nine this morning. Let the power of the Holy Spirit enable you and me to overcome Satan. You know, Cameron said this morning in a praise report, thank God for the Holy Spirit. And I hope that you are personally aware this morning that as a Christian, you are totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit to be and to do. Basically, for you to be who God wants you to be and for you to do what God wants you to do, you need the Holy Spirit. Amen? Um, when a person comes to Christ, they are instantly born of the Spirit. If that doesn't happen, a person is not saved, okay? Um, so if you're truly saved, you're born of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost comes to live within you. Without the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit, when you get saved, it would be impossible to live the Christian life. Impossible. That's why you can look around you, out there, in everyday life, and you come across religious people who have encountered religion, but they haven't encountered Jesus Christ. And you start to share biblical truths that has been revealed to you, and not only do they not get it, but they actually react to it. And they don't just react to the truth, they react to you preaching the truth. Well, that's because they have not been born of the Spirit. They're blind, they're dead, they're deaf. First John 5.18 says, He that is begotten of God, or born of God, keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Have you ever thought about a scripture like that? Ultimately, the devil does not control you. The devil cannot do whatever he wants with you if you're born of God. To defeat the devil, you better be plugged into the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's the Holy Spirit who gives us knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Okay, so knowledge is what that thing is. Understanding is when you get it. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. Okay? So I don't know about you. I, you know, Over the years, I've read uh, the book of Proverbs quite a lot. Okay? Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm actually in a process of going... I go through Proverbs, I get to the end, I go right to the start again. This is where I feel God has me. I'm like going, and I think I've been through it, I'm on my fourth or fifth time, just going Proverbs 1 to Proverbs 31. A lot of time you'll see knowledge, understanding, and wisdom in Proverbs. Amen. And sometimes we, can, we want to be religious or look spiritual or smart and, you know, amen. But a lot of time it's like, what's the difference? I don't know about you. I'm like, what's the difference? So there is a difference between those three things. Um, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power and the ability to fulfill what God is asking of us. I know in this house this morning, God is asking a lot of things of us at the moment. It pointless me naming 1,000 things that he could possibly do be dealing with you because you know personally there's going to be an issue in your life there's going to be maybe neglect in your life that the holy spirit is dealing specifically with you at the moment but it, you your neighbor mightn't even be dealing with that maybe god dealt with them a year ago about that maybe he's going to deal with them in a year's time maybe in a month's time so because we're all so different we are so dependent on the spirit of god actually to put his finger right where we are today um, I can assure you that even as I'm preaching this message, I can assure you I've been attested in this message all week. So if you think that I'm just preaching this because I have, I have just absolutely conquered this, the answer is no. I preach the truth because this is what God has laid upon my heart. But in all these subjects, we're all growing, we're all developing, and we're all going somewhere. I want to say something, and this may help you on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. 
Omnis, uh, omnipotent means all powerful. Um, omniscient means all known. Omnipresent means he's everywhere. Do you know the Holy Spirit is all that? So, do you not think that it would be smart for us to cooperate with him? I'm telling you that when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we nearly talk about the Holy Spirit as it. But the Holy Spirit is him. The Holy Spirit is a person. A person who is literally living in you today as a Christian. Think about this. An all-powerful, an all-knowing, an omnipresent Holy Spirit is living inside of you. So it, it was real... It is real wise for us to be sensitive to the Spirit, um, to move with the Spirit, to work with the Spirit. By the way, and we're talking about defeating this devil, the Holy Spirit is smarter and more powerful and more able than the devil. And even though at times you don't know, even though you're ignorant of what's coming around the bend, because we, we hear that even in the testimonies this morning, we don't know what's coming around the corner. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's coming around the corner. That's why we need His help. Um, I want to also say this by way of introduction. We, we have a choice when it comes to spiritual warfare. We, we, can, we have the free will to think in the natural and function in the natural. Would you agree? We also have the ability to think spiritually, but then function in the natural. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. We also have the ability as believers to think in the spirit and then function in the spirit. And I'm telling you that maybe a lot of the times we're guilty of thinking spiritually, but then when it comes to putting it into operation, we function in the natural. We kind of do it our way. And I'm just telling you that there is a way that God wants us to do, and that is to think spiritually and act spiritually. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus used the Word of God to destroy the devil in the wilderness. Would you agree? We talked about that a few weeks ago. He absolutely dismantled the devil with that phrase, it is written, it is written, it is written. Um, but it would be wrong of us to ignore the place and the power of the Holy Spirit in what Jesus was also doing. And I think sometimes we get so focused on it is written that we forget that there was a power behind those words. And of course, Jesus could, being God, just relied upon himself. But do you know that Jesus relied on the power of the Spirit? He was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was also led of the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I'm just trying to help you because he is our example this morning. If you want proof of that, you find it in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I want you to just think for a moment because we live in a day where there's a lot of demon busters out there. They're just saying, well, I feel God's led me to go and uh, take head on the demon powers over Omaha or whatever. Let me tell you, whatever you're dealing with, if God leads you, you're in good territory. But if you're not led of the Spirit, you could end up getting an awful kicking. I'm saying if you're operating in the flesh or if you're operating in some religious spirit, then I can tell you what, everything could just backfire on you really quick. So I'm saying that Jesus here, the way that he functioned should be the way that we function. Yes, we use the word of God, but we use it under the unction, the inspiration and the leading of the Holy Ghost. By the way, if you want evidence how it can be abused. Just look at the devil. In this battle, the devil used the word of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. He quoted the word of God. Amen. 
So I'm saying quoting the word of God of itself is not enough. But when you quote the word of God, like Peter shared earlier, and he testified that the Holy Ghost come upon him, that that's where your words, that's where the word of God then takes on a different dimension. Because it's no longer you, it's God. It's God's word and God's spirit functioning, ministering to those around us. Let's not underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus chose to depend upon the power of the Spirit and being led of the Spirit, how much more should we frail human creatures do likewise? Would you agree? I mean, I'm going to be honest, without the Holy Spirit, we're a mess. When you're in the flesh, when I'm in the flesh, it's not pretty. We just It seems so easy to go the way of the flesh. It doesn't take effort. But to go the way of the Spirit takes real effort. It takes, very, it takes discipline. You need to be very intentional. And you need to be very sensitive. We've spoken for a few weeks about the importance of employing the Word of God. Um, of course... It's not enough knowing the word, you need to put it into practice. That's what we're talking about. Um, so we need divine help. So I just want to emphasize this because it's important. I cannot s- emphasize this enough that knowledge of itself is not enough. We must understand that knowledge and then apply that knowledge. What I'm saying is to know a thing is not to be a thing. To know a thing is not to accomplish it. And here's something that's sobering, but it's a fact. I'm convinced that the devil knows whether you truly grasp this book. You know, he knows the clowns out there that are just quoting it and they don't even believe it. Would you agree? And by the way, he'll high-five those clowns Mm -hmm. who, who preach the truth... But they twist the truth. And he knows also who's real. He knows who is doing something under their own strength or who's doing it under the strength of the Holy Ghost. When you come into the workplace, when you go home to your home that's maybe full of people that are not saved or you go to a ball game and you're surrounded by a team that's not saved, If you're in the Spirit, the devil's scared. If you're not in the Spirit, why would he be scared of you? 2 Corinthians 3, 5 that we read this morning says this, Our sufficiency is of God, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. That's not just talking about pastors or elders or, or leaders. Every single believer in this house this morning should be an able minister of the New Testament. You're a minister this morning. You are a minister of the gospel. When you go through customs or whenever you go through the airport security, they ask you, what's your occupation? You can say, I'm a minister of the gospel. Because that's what God says you are. Amen? Amen? It goes on to say, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What does that mean? It basically means if you read this book as a mere religious book of do's and don'ts, then it'll probably not have any impact on you. Would you agree there's millions of people who profess Christ today? Um. Maybe there's a lot of them that even read this book. Like there's professors out there. They've got letters after the name. They're they're doctors of theology. But they don't know him. Do you understand? that? So it's not enough to actually know this book. Like they could probably argue with you from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, I'll go further. Think about the cults. The cults know this book. And they'll quote this book. 
but they'll misrepresent this book. So if you don't think the devil knows that, that they're stupid, like he does, he's got them because they belong to him. He's their daddy. He's their father. But he knows with you and me, as imperfect as we are, he knows with all our struggles that when we cry out for help and we start to function as God wants us to do, he knows we're a threat. It could be a phone call. You make a simple phone call to someone. There's going to be a battle with that. Because there's life. When you are burdened for somebody, then you give them what's been laid on your heart and you're under the unction of the Spirit, then it's not you making the phone call. When you knock on that door that's been laid upon your heart, somebody who you just can't shake them off. You knock on that door and you come just to pray for them. It's not you knocking on the door. It's actually God. Because the Holy Ghost has not only laid it upon your heart, but the Holy Spirit Ghost has empowered you to get out of your house, to get in your car, to go there, to share this message to them. So I'm saying, is God knocking on their door? It's God making that phone call. If we could only grasp that, but the key is the spirit within us. And I'm saying, when you feel that and you can't shake it off, and you try to shake it off, but that What's laid upon your heart, that person, that need, you can't shake it off and then you respond to that, then you're a potent weapon. It could be something that you have to say. It could be a scripture. I'm saying whatever it is, if it's under the unction of the Spirit, it'll have impact. Mm -hmm. That's why when Jesus spoke those words, he wasn't dependent upon himself. He didn't just turn up and say, the Messiah's here. He didn't. He wasn't elevating himself. In fact, he did the opposite. What did he say to his father? Not my will. But thy will be done. There's personality. It's not me. It's you. Reading or listening to the Bible without the aid of the Holy Spirit is death. I believe that's what that text is telling us. Another scripture text is found in John 6.63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen? The good news this morning is it doesn't matter what you're going through today. This book, being energized by the Holy Spirit, can minister into any need or any situation in your life. So, this congregation could be going through a hundred different situations today. There could be 500 needs in this church this morning. And God, through one message, could minister to every single one of them. Amen. Hallelujah. And the preacher wouldn't need to mention one of them. Anybody believe that? Yes, sir. The, do you believe in the power of the Word of God and the power of the Spirit of God? I know it. Sir. That if it's God, then it's God actually speaking. Mm -hmm. And when God speaks, when God speaks, then that situation that looks impossible, that looks hopeless, suddenly doesn't. Because God is speaking into it. And once God speaks into it, that's it. The devil is defeated. Amen? Hallelujah. The devil is instantly defeated when God says no or go. And sometimes he will empower you to actually speak those words on his behalf. And a lot of times we're praying for God to do it and he's saying, but I want you to do it. I want you to employ what I've given you. Now, if you a few months ago, maybe it was a few years ago, it seems like a few months ago, in Bible study, we quoted a verse. And I know I was talking to Sherry about this, about the difference between revelation and enlightenment. And, of course, if somebody asks me a question, it, I don't shake it off. I kind of chew on it. 
I chew on it and I try to follow it up, study it until I get to the bottom of it. And I just don't want to know this book intellectually. I want to know it in a deep way. And I'm sure you're the same. Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. Now, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice the word revelation and the word enlightenment. And I just want to remind you that there's a difference between revelation and enlightenment. Okay? So revelation is this. Revelation refers to the actual truth that God puts in front of you. Okay? God gives you a revelation. Enlightenment describes when you get it. Basically, when the light switches on. We've all heard of the word epiphany. Amen? Amen. Epiphany. It's whenever you get an epiphany. It's like, ah, I get it. Have you been there? Where Maybe there's a truth you've, you've heard from you were like four years of age in church. You've heard that truth and then suddenly you're sitting in church and suddenly that truth becomes an aha moment. Amen. It's like, I finally get it. Okay? So I'm saying that revelation could have been given to you for years. And, and intellectually you could repeat it and say, yeah, yeah, the Bible says, amen, brother, amen. But you could walk in that intellectual knowledge, but it's a revelation to you, but it's not an epiphany. It's not. So another word for, for enlightenment is illuminated. Amen. Yeah. It's when the light switches on. We used to sing the song, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Amen? Amen. But I'm just telling you, it could be any given subject. It could be any given situation. It's when the light switches on and you're like, aha, I get it. Devil, I know what you're at. Or Lord, I know what you're at, more importantly. And sometimes we need to get a revelation of both. I say, I love it whenever I get a revelation of what God is doing. And it's like, okay, Lord, I get it. Okay. We heard about it this morning. I think Kyle talked about it. You know, going through situations that sometimes they don't make sense. But sometimes we have to go through that for God to show us ourselves. Yeah. Oh my God. And we're like, we complain and we murmur and we like... Lord, what's happening? What, why am I having to go through this? And in the end, God's actually trying to show us who we are. There's a lot of moving parts sometimes to the will of God. And that's why sometimes we need to be stepped back, look at what's happening, look what we're hearing, look what we're feeling, look what we're thinking. And it's like, is this me? Is this God? Is this the devil? Or is this somebody else? Because it's not just what you feel. It's sometimes it can be other people are influencing you by what they feel. And what they feel is wrong. What you feel is wrong. And what the devil feels is wrong. But what God feels is right. And that's why the Holy Spirit can tell you what is really the truth. Are you with me? Amen. So, you must be sensitive to the Spirit. You must be reliant on the Spirit. And you must also be obedient to the Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit laying upon your heart at the moment? Who is He laying upon your heart at this morning? At the moment, you know, I think one of the saddest indictments on the Church of Jesus Christ in our day is that we're not meeting the need around us, and the reason we're not meeting the need, there's no indictment on God. Would you agree? I mean, God is in the exact same place as he was when America was in revival. God hasn't moved. God hasn't in any way lost any of his power. He hasn't in any way, 
His truth is no more diminished today than it was then. The problem is always his people. Read, read the scriptures. Read the Old Testament. Do you ever read the kings, the story of the kings? One king is in revival. The next king is not in revival. The next king maybe is not in revival. And then they get a good run. There's three good kings. Do you ever read that? And do you ever see how the king goes this way? Where do the people go? <laughs> and then one king, and it's like, how are they so stupid? Did you ever think that? Like, I mean, are these guys, are, I mean, here they are, they're dancing naked around a, a, around a, a golden calf. Like, like, are they out of their mind? Are they out of their mind? The, the real practical fact is we do the same at times. You know, if everybody else is not doing it, then we're not going to do it. Or that brother's not doing it, so I'm not going to do it. That sister's not doing it. And it's like, oh, on Judgment Day, the Lord's going to say, oh, I understand. I understand. You, you lived in a day uh, uh, of compromise and you, uh, oh, come here. I, oh, just put your head. You think the Lord's going to do that? Or is he going to say, but my word said. And my word was not, just because you lived in 2023 and you didn't live in the, the 1700s when there was the New England revival. I, I, why did you not take me at, your, at my word? But Lord, I, I, you knew my word, but you didn't implement my word. And I think what happens is we all justify ourselves and yet, when you look at rebellion in the Old Testament and you look at obedience, you're looking at yourself. Because we walk in both. The, the scary thing today is we're not meeting the need. There's people that could be in church this morning they are not in church, but have we even made an effort with them? Have we reached out, made a phone call, or have we went to visit them, see how they're doing? There's maybe people who have never been in church and they're waiting for us to go and bring them to church. Well, you know, I'm always in a rush on Sunday morning. I just don't have time. I understand. Judgment Day, I understand. I understand. You were just too busy. You think the Lord's going to understand that one? I think we need to sometimes recalibrate, stock take, and say, are we functioning like the New Testament church functioned? All of us. This preacher, this congregation, the church in America, have we got our focus right? Are we excited about spiritual things or do we get excited about other things? I'm preaching to me this morning, by the way. If nobody else gets anything this morning, I'm getting something. Even right now as I'm speaking. Because you know, and I know, and you know there's times that you've went to minister to somebody else and God's ended up ministering to you. Oh, yeah. Have you ever been there? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just telling you that it happens to me a lot in this pulpit, that I'm preaching to you, but as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. And the Holy Spirit can be speaking to me as I'm speaking to you. That's the power of the Spirit of God. Right. Thank God for the power of the Spirit. Hallelujah. By the way, He knows you and He knows me. And we can't hide from them. Amen? I want to give you a couple of powerful scriptures um, that could help you this morning. Jesus said in John 14, 26, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's a very powerful promise this morning. Is there anything that Jesus said that wasn't true? That's what he said. Jesus said in John 16, 13, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And he will show you the things to come. Has the devil ever convinced you that something was a reality when it was an illusion? Anybody? I'm going to ask that question again. Has the devil ever convinced you personally, 
you, 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 you. Has the devil ever convinced you that something was a reality when it was an illusion? Okay. That's why you and me need the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Now, I get it. We're slow. We're kind of, you know, I know when I was at school and they would talk derogatory about somebody, they'd say, that guy's slow. <laughs> like he, he failed all the exams and he, he just, you, t- he, you know, but I'm telling you, we're slow. When it comes to spiritual matters, I'm telling you, we're slow. And it's like the Lord said, how many times do I need to tell him? How many times do I need to tell her that that's wrong and that's right? Honestly, we're slow learners. Thank God the Word of God says the Holy Ghost, the God himself, is long-suffering. Because if God wasn't long-suffering then there would be no hope for any of us. And listen, he's very, very, very gracious. And he's very, very, very merciful. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad you don't belong to a legalistic church? Three strikes and you're out. Aren't you glad? We don't believe that junk, Amen? amen? We believe that a righteous man can fall but the Lord is there to pick him up. Hallelujah. Amen. I would say most times you fall, it's not yourself picking you up. It's him saying, okay, yeah. right, come on, get up. Amen. Dust down, slap, slap, <laughs> waking up. Amen? Yeah, yeah. But he does it in love. Yeah. I'm glad that he's had to slap my face, like sober me up, like, Paul, are you <laughs> in your right mind? <laughs> just, like, just as bad as those Israelites dancing around that golden calf naked. I believe that just a lot of the things that we have done in our lifetime has been as grievous to God as that there. Mm-hmm. Right. Or do you think I'm, I've kind of just stepped over a line there? No. no. Be honest. Yeah, it, the same grievance that God had there, He has with us at times. But I know sometimes He goes, oh, here He goes again. Here she goes again. But he doesn't turn away from us. Hallelujah. Thank God. He actively works on us by the Spirit. First of all, convicting us by the Spirit. Then if we don't get it with conviction, he chastises us. Right. And until. Until. Mm-hmm. Not if, but until we get it. Uh-huh. And when we get it, we, and he brings us to our senses, then we're usable. Amen? Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm just telling you that knowledge, the Word of God, when it comes to spiritual warfare, is not enough. And you may think that's heresy this morning, but it's not. Because the letter killeth, but the Spirit quickeneth. The two work together. You can't divorce them. I'm here to tell you the devil is a master of delusions. The only way that he can be exposed, like practically, is where the Spirit tells you that's a lie. And that's because the Holy Ghost knows. 1 John 2, 27 says, The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the, the same anointing teaches you all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Amen. Amen. That's a powerful verse. Amen. So, whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whoever you're struggling with, the Holy Spirit can reveal the truth because the Holy Spirit knows. Amen. I'm basically here this morning to tell you that you need help. <laughs> Who needs help this morning? 
Okay, thank God for honesty, because I was scared that three hands would go up there. And then, oh, the pastor told me I needed help. Yes, you do need help. But it's not the pastor telling you, it's, I believe, the Holy Spirit. We, that's why the Bible says we've got a helper. People need a helper who need help. I need a helper every day. Every moment of every day. Because I have a mind and a heart that wants to go the wrong way. So I need help. And you need help. But here's good news. Second, well, it's all good news, by the way. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12.10 When I am weak, then I am strong. It's not, it's not profound. That's one of those things that probably the rel- religious mind reads that and says, that doesn't make sense. Right. It's a mystery, though. But Paul explains that mystery. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Here's the key. I'm telling you, sometimes we have to be brought to a weak and vulnerable point before we actually waken up and smell the coffee. I'm telling you, that's the story of my life. It's the story of your life. That a lot of the things that we're cursing, is actually an actual blessing. I think Kyle was covering that this morning. And here's an interesting thing, because you know I'm a I'm not King James only, but I, I'm generally a King James man. That phrase, my strength is is made perfect in weakness. That word strength there is actually dynamis. And we know what the word dunamis means. It means power. Or we have English variations of that word uh, dunamis today, like dynamic, dynamite, or dynamo. You know what a dynamo is? Any of you mechanics know what a dynamo is? Huh? It's like a turbo. Okay? Uh, just You know what dynamite is? Yeah. Amen? I just want to make sure I'm not talking in Swahili. Okay? <laughs> Peter, am I talking in Swahili today? You know what dynamic means? Huh? That football player is dynamic. He's powerful. Huh? Okay. Well, it says my dynamite, my dunamis is made perfect in weakness. So that weakness that you're going through today, that God can show his power in the midst of that weakness. Did Jesus not say in Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power or dunamis after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. If you want that dunamis this morning, let the Holy Ghost come upon you right now. Let him envelop you. Let him empower you. Let him enlighten you. Whatever you need this morning, ask him for it. We heard it again this morning. We don't receive because we ask amiss. If you need knowledge, if you need understanding, if you need wisdom, ask of him. We're all in different places dealing with different things at the moment. But it doesn't matter what you're going through. He can actually meet your need right now. By the way, I don't go to Fox News to find out what I should be doing. I go to Jesus. I don't go to CNN to see what I should be doing. Okay? I I go to Jesus. Amen? So, I have another question. And I want you to be honest with me this morning. How many of you in this service have widescreen televisions? Widescreen televisions. Okay. Huh? Who's got who's got impressive widescreen televisions? Okay. Okay. Who's got a fridge freezer? Um who's got a dishwasher? Okay. Okay. Be honest with me this morning. How effective, how useful would they be without electricity? 
I mean, imagine bringing me to your house and going, hey, I want to show you this new widescreen TV I have. It's the best TV on the market. What do you think of it? Cool. Does it work? <laughs> well, if I had electricity, it would work, but I just liked it. <laughs> I mean, how dumb would that be? Do you understand? Well, I'm saying that for a reason, because I'm telling you that you are more reliant on the whole, being plugged into the Holy Ghost than that TV is in being plugged in to the electricity. I'm telling you, you are absolutely useless. You're powerless without being plugged into Him. And I think one of the things is we do so many things in life and we're not plugged into Him and then we wonder why there's no fruit from it, why there's no power, why there's no effect. Why are we so, why am I so discouraged? Why am I so defeated? A lot of times because we're not plugged into Him. And I'm saying that reverently this morning because it, it, it's kind of a modern phrase. I hear a lot now, I'm plugged into this or you know, we're, we're plugged into everything now it is. I'm plugged into this here today. But, we're, we're, you know, but we live in a day where everybody's plugged into something. Or, you know, you need to plug into our YMCA. We're, we're the best YMCA in the area, whatever. We use, that, we use that phrase very glibly. But I'm telling you, we need to be plugged into the Holy Ghost. If ever there's a day where we need plugged into Him, it's today. So, as we come to a close, I'm going to skip some of my notes this morning because I feel I just I want to move quickly to prayer. I want to kind of finish with prayer. It would be wrong for us to talk about overcoming the devil with the power of the Spirit without talking about prayer. So I just want to touch it briefly. We all know that passage, or most of us do, Romans 8, 26 and 27. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. Now, I want to confess as a pastor, as a Christian, there's many times I don't know what to say or what to pray. There's many situations I find myself in. It could be counseling. It could be a tragic situation that a pastor gets called to. It could be a phone call late at night. And I'm like, what do I say here? What do I say when somebody's going through this hellish situation? And it's like, I mightn't audibly say it because I'm on the phone or whatever, but it's like, I'm like, help. Help. There's many times with counseling situations where I would stand in our sunroom and I would see somebody coming. I was meant to meet them at 7 o'clock at night. And they're coming up the driveway and I'm like, help, Lord. I do not know what to say. And I don't know what to pray. Have you ever been there? Where you're actually, you're devoid of words what to pray. Yeah. I mean, you could give your, your shopping list to God, but you know, that's not going to cut it. What, where, what you're actually going through, this is not enough. And I'm telling you, at times like that, you are qualified to ask the Holy Ghost to help you actually pray what He wants you to pray. And I'm telling you, as the Holy Ghost energizes your prayers, things start to happen. It mightn't be immediately, but things start to happen. It mightn't even happen for 10, 20 years, 40 years. There's people in this church have prayed for years for an answer to prayer, and then finally it came. Why? Because they refused to give up. There's times we're heartbroken. There's times we're troubled in our mind where we just don't know. But I'm telling you that when it comes to prayer, if you pray what God's laying upon your heart, stand back and watch. By the way, if the Holy Ghost is laying a person upon your heart to pray for them, guess what? They're going to get saved. Because the Holy Spirit knows. 
The Holy Spirit knows right now every single person who's going to be in heaven and knows every single person who's going to be in hell. Mm -hmm. Why would the Holy Ghost get you to pray for 10 years or for 20 years or for 40 years or for 5 years Mm -hmm. for somebody knowing full well that they're never going to get saved? He knows. Would you agree? So if he knows exactly whether they're going to be in heaven or hell, why would he continually burden you to pray for them to go to heaven? Why? Is he playing games with you? No. He didn't give up on us, and he expects us not to give up on them, even when it looks hopeless or when it looks like it's impossible. I'll finish with this scripture. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I'm telling you that this this message is encouraging this morning, but it's also challenging. I know for me, I'm just talking for me here, so I can't talk for you. But I think we need reminded how reliant we are on the Holy Ghost for every spiritual duty, for even to think right. Seriously, I can't trust the world out there. I can't trust... There's not many people out there that I trust in in the secular world. How about you? There's there's just... It's all... They're just so messed up. It's it's Everybody's just captivated. It's pride. Ultimately, the root of everything out there is pride. Mm -hmm. The reason why they're not born again is because they're pride. Mm -hmm. Pride. They're deceived, but they're deceived because they're proud. They know better. I'm telling you, the only one that we can 100% trust is God. Because He knows. The rest of us, we know a little bit, but most of the time we don't know much. We think we know. Let us pray. This message is, I believe, for everyone here today. Everyone who has got ears to hear, eyes to see. I wonder, are you relying on the Holy Ghost this morning? I don't want anybody to raise their hand. I, I, this is very personal between you and him. Um, but we've been reminded just of our dependence upon the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the living God lives within you. Isn't that amazing? The omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God lives within you, can lay things in your heart, can show you things that you have no clue about. And guess what? He's right. He's not speculating, I think or I feel. He's saying, I know. I think it'd just be good for us, just in our own way, just to ask the Holy Spirit to help us afresh. Help me, Lord. If there's anything in there, remove my stinking thinking. Remove my untrustworthy feelings. Lord, just give me your heart and your mind. God, forgive us, oh God. Lord, we want to thank your thoughts. Lord, there's people around us that need help. I pray that we would think your thoughts and feel your heart for this generation. Lord, we're, we're here for a very big purpose. We're here to glorify you, but we're here, Lord, to respond to your voice and to reach those who you want us to reach. Lord, if there's someone on our heart today, I pray that we will put feet to our faith with that person that's upon our heart. It could be a text message. It could be a visit. It could be a card. Whatever it is, Lord, would you just help us know and then help us do. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning.